here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Karen, uh, Dr. Gray, for being here, um, as well as the other advocates. Uh, if you could just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here this afternoon, and thank you so much for this hearing. I think it's really important, and I want to start off by saying that uh, we're not here to point fingers. We're here to re come to some resolution and solutions, and we've been working with a number of these agencies to do just that. We all have an ownership in this, and we all want to fix it, so I definitely want to start off with saying that. Um, I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kira Bradford Gray, and I am the Chief Public Defender of the Defender Association where we do represent youth uh, both on what we would call dependency, those are children that have been deemed to be abused and neglected. I am here with my remarkable team of lawyers and social workers from our child advocate unit, and I can say this, I'm here as the face presenting this, but the work is being done by these professionals who are committed every day. And we do recognize that while we're doing the work that we want to do and that we need to do, we have further to go. And we're always willing to make sure that we're doing what we need to do for these young children who are brave enough here to talk about their experiences. Um, I'm also here joined today by my staff on our delinquent unit, and that is Mr. Elvin Glada, Lisa Campbell, um, Ellen Sapper, who has a new role, which is to look at dispositional reviews. So meaning, what she does is she works with the kids and figures out what their experience has been in the placements that they have been in. And we've actually hired a fellow to do um, interviews for these youth to talk about some of the things that they probably wouldn't say while they were in the placements. We used to go out and actually we have a contract with DHS where we, they provide us funding to go out and visit our children while they're in placement. But what we found is that when we go out there and we ask them, how is their experience? They're really afraid to talk to us while they're in that placement for fear of retaliation. So we thought it's a better model to talk to them once they're out. And we will be compiling all of that data and bringing it to the forefront so that we can find out some you know, solutions to some of the glaring things that we've seen. I'm also here with our education specialist. Like I said, one of the things that the Defender Association lawyers understand is that we cannot do everything and we don't know everything. And one of the main drivers of our juvenile uh, justice systems uh, access to our kids have been special education needs. So we did hire a woman, Catherine Vendredes, and she's been amazing to our lawyers to understand what the school district must do before we send kids to our juvenile justice system. And we've been instrumental in getting cases stopped from criminal from prosecution and getting the school to better address those needs. We can do it much more. Thank you so much for that because I'm very proud of that. We can do it much more, but the more we understand what's driving the behaviors, the better off we'll be in coming to resolutions. And then lastly, we have our policy analyst who's been doing amazing work, and she's, her name is Leola Hardy. She actually did reach out to Juvenile Law Center to build this coalition called Closer to Home. And Helen, given your office has been involved in yours too, uh, Councilwoman Brown. Um, and we've been looking at models of people who had less reliance on placement. Now with that said, I'm going to go into just a brief PowerPoint demonstration just to kind of illustrate some of the information that we provided in our written testimony. This just talks about how many children we represent so we really have an understanding of a, a vast majority of our youth as to what their issues are related to coming into our systems and what their needs are. Unfortunately, some of our um, resources do not fit the needs, especially as it relates to our young girls. Now, before I show this, this is kind of illustrative of the point that when we're talking about using placement, we need to, when I, when I hear that we're looking at compliance, it's not just compliance we need to be worried about. We need to be worried about culture. Some of the things that we have seen before in terms of culture is that our youth have shipped all over the country. And in some of these areas, they don't have the ability to understand some of the urban needs that our children have, some of their, their, their uh, neighborhoods, some of their, their experiences, all the things that we would think and we would hope that children can identify with those who are responsible for rehabilitating them with. And so we have children who I believe are overly disciplined. 
children who are overly uh, dealt with in such aggressive manners, and it only exacerbates their feeling of worthlessness and doesn't give them an opportunity. Now before I show this video, I want to give uh, anyone in the audience an opportunity to leave if you want. There are going to be some disturbing visuals in this video. The faces are blacked out, so we can't tell who they are. We've gotten written and expressed permission from our client to show this video. Um, the, the, uh, this is going to feature what happened in a uh, situation, in a case where we had, where it was recommended that a child of ours go to placement because of mental health needs. Um, once they got there, there were some issues related to the interaction with the staff. The interaction, the staff had uh, some physical uh, uh, ways of dealing with our child, and our child was actually arrested and put into adult uh, custody for, and sat in adult custody for about two months until Ellen Sapper was able to get the video show that it wasn't our child that actually was aggressive toward the staff. She gave the video to our DHS uh, partners and DHS reached out to the district attorney in Pike County where all charges were dropped. Unfortunately, at the time that the uh, the uh, case went to court, our child was now considered an adult and sat in adult prison, which had a lot of psychological trauma on him. Um, so this is a state facility, it is not a local facility, but if anyone would like to leave, I'll give you an opportunity now, uh, otherwise we're going to show the video. Right. Uh, yes, we are, and his face is black, and I apologize, that's the uh, focal point. What you're viewing is the counselors really kind of pummeling this one child, and the other ones are sitting back because this is normal to them. This is what happens uh, in these placements. Can you clarify again, are we looking at the same timeline or is this a different day? This is the same day, um, just in a different section of that facility. Thank you. 
I showed that not to spar up emotions, but in a way to do that. Because I think we talk about it, but we don't have a way to really see the type of trauma that is being instituted to our, in our kids each time that we send them away to get rehabilitated. This did not rehabilitate that youth, in fact, it exacerbated his issues. And many of the youth around that have watched that and have dealt, felt like this is normal behavior, this is how they are supposed to be dealt with and handled. And we never want this. So when we're talking about looking at placements, we're not just talking about them taking our kids away from their homes. We're talking about it from an, an area of respect and dignity that we should have for our kids and an understanding that they are kids who are very impressionable and whose trauma exacerbates with some of these issues. So without being able to see this, we would have accepted the version that our kid was the one that took an aggressive posture. Our kid was the one that escalated the situation. Our kid was the one that needed to be arrested and placed in, in, in handcuffs and sent to court. And I'm glad that DHS helped us get that reversed. I would be remiss if I didn't say or talk about the fact that just yesterday I received a call from Carson Valley um, and uh, the judge out there who said that 10 of our youth that were placed in Carson Valley were now arrested for issues or challenges that related that were that were in that that facility where people were acting rowdy and some were fighting. Our children, the Philadelphia kids, were actually arrested. So sometimes we're sending these kids to facilities because they have dependent needs and they're coming out with criminal convictions. And these are the things that we do not want. These are the things that the Defender Association works hard to, to avoid, but unfortunately, these are now in another county. I used to be the chief defender of Montgomery County, and I can tell you, Montgomery County does not send its kids to Carson Valley because there is an influx of Philadelphia kids there. So as a result, they don't want to mix them with Philadelphia kids. This is the perception of the children that we send there. There were town halls that were discussed in terms of there were going to be Philadelphia kids that infiltrated the schools, and we would not we would have a zero tolerance for them. So people know that we are using these facilities outside of our, our, our county, and they are looking at our kids as if they are different, and they are actually overly policing them, overly critical of what they're going through, and it, in fact exacerbating their trauma once again. So this is this is what I was I, I wanted to bring to the forefront of this hearing, and it's a real urgent need to rely less on these placements and build up community resources. Now, one of the things that we didn't talk about a lot is race and who's in these facilities, who's in our system. And as you see, 73% of the kill of the children in our juvenile justice system are black. That is glaring, and I think that's worthy to be said. As we're talking about race in our country and issues related to how we treat people of color, we know that the African American kids are coming into our system and they're only getting even more stereotyped by the fact that they are now a, a delinquent kid or if they go to, uh, to a dependent facility, they may come out a delinquent kid. 16% are Hispanic and 11% are, are white. So this is glaring when we're talking about our youth and their opportunities to prosper and we're looking at the disparities and who is prospering and who is not. Um, some of the more recent studies that have come out in terms of looking at school discipline shows that young African American kids are disciplined at a rate of almost eight times more than their white counterparts. I can tell you as a person has, that has been privileged to send my children to private schools, I see the difference in the way that children are disciplined and I see the difference between the way that children are even related or referred to the juvenile justice system. If I were a kid growing up in this day and age, I don't think I'd be able to become a lawyer based on some of the disciplinary practices that we have here and the labeling as a result of that. One of our areas of uh, main concern for the Defender Association is to look at and understand the effects that placement have on our youth. Um, we want to understand what are the res residential placements and what are they used for. And some of our, um, you know, our judges make determinations to place our youth based on what we would call a, uh, a referral process through a mental health social psych psych psychiatric evaluation. And sometimes the psychiatric evaluation labels our kids differently than what we see in terms of their life experience. For instance, we have seen children that have been um, mirrored with abuse uh, and trauma, but then would be uh, labeled as opp oppositionally defined disorder as well as ADHD. These things set off the course for treatment. 
I recently raised with some of our um, treatment providers, why, aren't there, why isn't there a PTSD diagnosis for our kids who have displayed or shown that they have been abused and neglected? And I was told a few different things, but right now we are starting to see that diagnosis creep up a little bit more, which can really start to help the funding resources for the therapeutic needs. Um, the Defender Association also has partnered with the University of Pennsylvania so that we can start looking at these evaluations and making recommendations for community-based options. Uh, and so this is something that has been a, a really big game changer in the way we advocate for our children. Before, we hadn't, hadn't had the wherewithal or experience to refute some of the evaluations or the diagnosis that have been given. But now we have uh, what we call our own in-house experts that are allowing us to understand that based on the information that's in the report, a diagnosis, uh, a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder is not warranted in this, in this uh, particular case. And we're able to bring that information to the courts as well as DHS, as well as community behavioral health, so we can have a different plan of treatment, one where the kid will actually uh, get, the, if it, get the rehabilitation that addresses their needs. Um, another area of concern is the rising, uh, the rise of young women in our juvenile justice system and the lack of resources that we have to deal with their issues. If you look at this map, this is, these are the placements by gender across the states. And as you see, the square uh, equals their, the placements that are um, strictly for women. There's only one in the state. And the uh, circle is the, are those for, that are strictly for males, and then the shaded and triangle are those that are um, that take both. We know George Junior Republic is not taken has not been taken admissions, so we're really down. And as a result, our young girls are forced to go outside of the state to other areas of the country to get rehabilitated. We have sent girls as far as New Mexico. Oh my God. And, and when we had a, a young girl that was in New Mexico and she was really having a hard time adjusting and she needed uh, hospitalization. And so New Mexico took her to Las Vegas to be hospitalized. And these are the types of things that our kids are seeing all the time. Um, we really need to focus on our, our girls and what we need to do even in our communities. For those that are not even in placement, but those are on probation, we don't have a lot of resources. I recently did have uh, some interaction with Councilwoman Brown's um, uh, office and through uh, one of her aides, and we started to build a community resource of, of female mentors for some of these youth, that the girls that are coming into our system. Our office screens them, comes up with a profile of what's driving the behaviors, and then matches them up with someone in the community through our Big Brother Big Sister program. And it's been tremendous because some of these young ladies, they just need someone else to talk to. They need someone else to understand what's going on with them. And it's brought a lot of information and understanding about what we need to be doing for some of these girls. But we have a long way to go, and we need to develop those resources. Um, you are, uh, at this point of your, your testimony, is very, very consistent with the testimony that was presented by our district attorney, um, uh, un underscoring the, the lack of programming for girls. We don't even have a sense of what's out there for girls. So we must have tonight already introduced the resolution calling for a hearing to let's get our, a finger on the pulse of what exists, what's in the universe, and let that guide us on what we need to do more of. Your testimony for only punctuates what he's stating on the record as well. Thank you so much for that. Th thank you. Our, our lawyers and our social workers look in, the, in our community, and I will tell you the resources are very limited. So I, I, I appreciate the fact that you have your finger on that pulse. We really need more opportunities for girls to stay in their communities and get what they need. Um, again, I talked about some of the assumptions uh, that of why kids are going into placement. 30% of the people or the children that the Defender Association represents go to placement for truancy purposes. And as we've heard time and time again, that they go to placement because they're not going to school, they're not doing well in school, and they go to these placements and they're really not getting the education that they need. We've, we've been working with the coalition to build up this ability to understand what we need for educational purposes in some of these placements. Um, and I think that the DHS and the CBH, others have been on board, Dr. Height have been on board with exploring this. We just need to move the, like you said, the meetings into a plan of action as to how we're actually going to attack this. 
uh, but it is something that Stoney Foundation had done an extensive, re extensive research on and really found that many of these placements would not meet the educational needs of our kids. If you go there and you actually see the areas that's designated for learning, most of them are sitting by themselves to do packets or some of them are looking on the computer without instruction. If you actually go and see it, and it's something that is an eye opener, and I think that we're all willing to address that, and I hope to be a part of that movement coming soon. Um, other reasons why that we place kids are because of their mental health needs, but as we just learned through a hearing we had called Closer to Home, is that uh, New York has stopped relying on placement to deal with mental health needs. They've been looking at resources within the community that help people navigate some of the culture that, of their own environment that exacerbates some of their mental health needs. And so that's what I'm hoping that we can move to, identifying those opportunities to say that while kids are in their own areas, there are triggers that they need to be able to deal with. And if we constantly send them away to deal with these in a setting that is not like their own environment, then when they come back, they're still not going to be able to cope with some of those pressures and those, those traumas that are triggers for their mental health needs. So with that, I will end my uh, segment. And I think some of the possible solutions is to, of course, bring our youth uh, that are in far away residential placements back to Philadelphia. We have to build our understanding of our needs here. I think we're all in agreement that sending them away to far away is, is serving no purpose. And then we cannot understand what's going on in that culture and environment that may be different than Philadelphia. Two, they are looking, they're, they're being met with people who don't look like them, who don't understand some of their cultural environment and backgrounds. So these things are really not making for the best opportunities for rehabilitation. Um, and we're going to be working collaboratively with stakeholders to assess these things. The compliance standards that we use, we need to, to look at culture and environment as well, and not to think that just some kind of uh, you know, check marks on a paper will do it, but also understanding what type of culture and environment should our kids be in, and working with these placements to understand diversity needs, diversity and inclusion needs. As you saw in that video, there were no diverse staff. None. And I know when I was a young practitioner and I went into these uh, placements to, to see reviews, I often saw kids getting what they call disciplinary infractions for listening to rap music. These are things that would attack on months in their placement because they were listening to rap music when they were told they could not. You know, you can't strip away someone's culture. You can only talk about them, about the healthiness of what they're listening to, but also kind of give some feedback and understanding of why this is a part of their culture. I myself do listen to rap music, and I don't feel like it's something that can be stripped away, but it's something that should be discussed in a, in a healthy way. We can't say that people aren't who they are just because they come in our placements, but we can embrace the difference in diversity. And so I really do hope that we look at not just what's happening in the placements, but the racial component as well, because it is a big deal. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gray. from our next two witnesses, um, and then we'll have a brief round of questions. And then, um, but uh, in the interest of time, and because we have our, you know, a wonderful stenographer who actually does need a break, we're going to have to limit testimony to four minutes a piece. Is that okay? Um, and then we have written testimony also for the audience members who are here if you'd like to pick up any of the written testimony, including the testimony of the young people who spoke earlier, those are available on the desk that were on this side. Um, and uh, I also want to acknowledge the presence of my council colleague, Council Member Quinones Sanchez, as well. So um, if, if you could, if the next witness can proceed, state your name and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Gam. Thank you for this opportunity to address City Council and the committee regarding the impact of residential placement on the education of children and youth in foster care and the juvenile justice system. My name is Maura McInerney and I'm the legal director at the Education Law Center, a statewide nonprofit legal organization dedicated to ensuring that all Pennsylvania's children have access to a quality public education. We represent the most educationally at-risk children, those living in poverty, children of color, English learners, children with disabilities, etc. Over our 45-year history, ELC has handled hundreds of individual impact cases on behalf of children in foster care and the juvenile justice system. My testimony today stems from ELC's years of experience 
in addressing the educational needs of children and youth in residential placement. Our clients' stories are heartbreaking. We've been fortunate to intervene in many cases, but too often youth returning from and in placement find themselves far behind their peers in school. It's a loss that follows them for the rest of their lives. Children who are system involved are among the most educationally at risk of all student populations. They graduate at lower rates, score lower on standardized tests, have higher rates of special education eligibility, and are more likely to repeat a grade. In Philadelphia, half of youth in foster care and 65% of youth in the juvenile justice system do not graduate from high school. However, children and youth placed in residential placements are at even higher risk of school failure and are more likely to drop out. And the reasons for this are very clear. First, children in residential settings are required to change schools. They're often placed far away from their families and their communities, and this educational disruption undermines any academic progress. A student loses four to six months of educational progress with every school move. In contrast, you are 50% more likely to graduate if you stay in the same school. Children in residential care more often attend one or more different placements, and they don't have the option to remain in the same school. Second, children in institutional placements commonly attend on-ground schools rather than local public schools. On-ground schools are predominantly private academic schools. They exist largely in the shadows with little oversight of any local education agency or the state. Pursuant to state policy, these programs are subject to on-site monitoring only once every six years, only with regard to students with disabilities. They have wide discretion in educational programming. They're not required to follow the same rigorous or curriculum requirements or academic standards of public schools. So students attending on-ground schools are taught in multiple grade classrooms, sometimes with uncertified or improperly certified teachers, who are, and they frequently receive below grade level coursework. 52% of child welfare providers report that the curriculum at on-ground school is far below grade level. It's often limited in instruction hours, relies heavily on worksheets, and fails to advance any basic skills. In some cases, students receive no education at all, or they spend their days completing worksheets, or they engage exclusively in credit recovery programs. They receive minimal or no live instruction. In addition, upon entering these schools, they're rarely evaluated. Moreover, the culture that exists in institutional placements undermines a child's ability to learn. How can a child learn if they are subject to fear, intimidation, restraints, physical and emotional abuse? Obviously, they're going to struggle in school. Many parents and education decision makers are never apprised of a child's legal right to attend a local public school, and in many cases, judge, judges are placing students in on-ground schools specifically under a misguided attempt to solve the truancy problem. Instead, children with a history of absenteeism find themselves farther and farther behind than when they return to their neighborhood schools, and they are more likely to drop out. Third, students with disabilities are more likely to be placed in residential facilities. And these are particularly harming to these children. Cyber school does not differentiate instruction. They are in credit recovery programs or one-size-fits-all program that will not work for them. The problems are myriad, from not obtaining a child's IEP to failing to do an appropriate and timely evaluation or progress monitoring, failure of school staff to differentiate instruction, failure to implement an IEP and providing no related services. Students with disabilities are denied a free appropriate public education to which they are entitled, and they're never educated in the least restrictive environment with non-disabled peers. Finally, when youth return from residential placements, they find themselves, through no fault of their own, far below grade level, having few credits, and having made little progress. Because private academic schools are not obligated to meet the same educational standards, the courses a youth takes will not align with the school district of Philadelphia to which they return. The courses they've had in residential schools may be electives and they will not count toward graduation. A few on-ground schools do not even provide credit-bearing courses at all, guaranteeing that a student already behind academically will not be able to graduate with their peers. In our survey, 85% of youth and 50% of child welfare professionals reported difficulties transferring credits at all to public school. In addition, upon their return to the school district of Philadelphia, many of our clients experienced delays of days or weeks in being placed in an appropriate classroom or approved private school. 
in summary, we know that placing children and youth in institutional placements will harm them academically, emotionally, and sometimes even physically. Institutional placements are highly restricted, they undermine academic progress, and they set our most vulnerable youth on a path to homelessness and unemployment. And all of this occurs with no oversight of children who are far away from families and communities. Our children must be safe, healthy, and receive all services to which they are legally entitled, including a quality education. We urge City Council to devote the resources that are necessary to end the segregation and isolation of our youth and institutional placements, and to build community-based, trauma-informed mental health and educational services in our city that will keep our children close to home with the educational opportunities and the stability that they desperately need and deserve to succeed in life. Thank you. Thank you. state your name uh, for the record and again um, we're trying to keep it to four minutes and feel free to summarize your testimony. Yes. Thank okay. you. Um, thank you council member Kim, um, council member Quinone Sanchez and committee members. Um, my name is Gabe LaBella and I'm a staff attorney at Disability Rights Pennsylvania. We are the independent statewide nonprofit corporation designated as the federally mandated protection and advocacy agency in Pennsylvania. DRP works to advance and protect the civil rights of adults and children with disabilities. Each year, hundreds of Philadelphia children with disabilities are removed from their communities and isolated from their families in distant institutional placements for long periods of time, with some even placed out of state, severing connections to family, to community, where the youth will return. I am here to ask that you proactively support efforts to bring our children home. When a child is adjudicated as dependent, in Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth from DHS, Office of Children, Youth and Families, and the Child Welfare Program in each of the counties is responsible for stability, permanency, and meeting the children's needs. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, nearly one-third of children coming into care have chronic medical conditions, and many more have mental and behavioral health needs. Many dependent children have post-traumatic stress disorder or other mental health disabilities due to abuse they suffered in childhood. Others have existing or developing mental health conditions that are exacerbated by abuse, neglect, or the conditions of their lives in the dependency system. Still others have physical or cognitive disabilities that their parents have found too overwhelming to deal with. For these children, the child welfare system, in conjunction with the medical assistance system, is responsible for providing trauma-informed mental health care and other community-based mental health and physical health services to preserve or reunify children and their families. When that is not possible, the child welfare system must provide appropriate homes, including therapeutic medical foster homes and residential treatment. Yet for hundreds of these children with disabilities, a safe home with a parental relationship and adequate health care is a distant dream. Due to an inadequate array of appropriate services and placements, children and youth are caught in a vicious cycle. Children are left in residential treatment facilities far beyond the point that such services are needed or beneficial because there is nowhere else for them to go. The children who actually need time-limited RTF placements are then left in inpatient acute care units, detention centers, or are sent to facilities far away from their families and communities because the RTFs have no beds for them or do not want to serve their complicated needs. Here's a story about a young woman, Siobhan, 15 years old, from Philadelphia. She has bipolar disorder, PTSD, and ADHD, with a history of hospitalization for attempted suicide. Siobhan was sexually abused at the age of five and was adjudicated dependent in 2012 at the age of 10. In 2016, she was adjudicated delinquent on a simple assault, assault charge and was placed at the Juvenile Justice Service Center in March 2017 
At that time, a psychiatrist recommended that she be placed at an RTS and receive trauma therapy. She was needlessly locked in juvenile detention center for nine months, a place designed for youth to stay an average of 10 to 15 days. She was there while waiting for an appropriate placement and services. Eventually, Siobhan was sent to an RTF in Virginia because no one else will accept her in Pennsylvania. Similarly, children with mental health disabilities that result in acting out behavior are often ordered into punitive placements through the delinquency court. This is not because that is what is recommended by the experts and not because it is what the judges deem appropriate, but because there are no other options available. Rather than getting the trauma-informed care that they need, they are re-traumatized, resulting in more acting out behavior, leading to even worse placements, such as adult prisons. Right now, DRP believes there are more, I, I can skip that, actually, we've had the data, and I'm almost done. Uh, DRP urges City Council to support a plan to, to obtain community resources that our children need to significantly reduce the population in residential placements and to reinvest funds in community-based trauma-informed services and programs. City Council must take an in-depth inventory of the needs of all Philadelphia children who are currently placed in institutional or residential settings. We ask that you call for a citywide task force of stakeholders to address this. Lastly, we ask that you require contracts with current providers be reassessed to ensure that all placements meet the health, safety, developmental, and education needs of youth and that oversight over all facilities be markedly improved. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Before we take a break, we have the time for a few questions. Um, do you have any questions? Um, I just have like one or two really quickly. Uh, for Ms. Bradford Gray, first of all, thank you very much for sharing uh, your powerful testimony. Um, how do you usually find out if a child you represent is restrained or injured or has issues with placement? Well, based on the proactiveness of our staff, uh, Ms. Ellen Sapper sitting here had created and went to the judge to get an order that whenever there are restraints, we receive notification and we do get that information relatively soon. And so I'm really thankful to the work that she did with the uh, courts to make that happen. And. Um, you know, many of the youth, as we heard earlier, are struggling or behind in school, you know, really need assistance in receiving their diplomas or GEDs while in placement. Um, do these placements help them meet their educational needs? Uh, Ms. McInerney, I think your testimony was pretty compelling around those concerns. No, they do not. In fact, some of them are not equipped to assist uh, the students in doing that, unfortunately. And the problem is that we're not paying any attention to the quality of the education when a child is placed there. The court should be considering it, GHS should be considering it. It has to be a factor when we decide whether or not to place the child in a particular facility. And it should be a part of the provider contracts as well to ensure that a child can receive and will receive quality education. May I also mention that, that the, the mechanism that Pennsylvania uses to license educational facilities at RTFs and other institutions, the private academic school regulations, which are not designed for that, are not appropriate for that, and that we really need to take a look at having regulations specifically addressing these type of places. And there has been a proposal to the Private Academic School Board that we revise this regulation. We proposed it for publicly placed children to have uh, academic standards that align with the district from which they come. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. And for clarity, the uh, school districts in the host counties in which the residential treatment facilities exist are prohibited from denying students placement solely based on their residential uh, status, is that correct? That's correct. Pursuant to 24 PS 1306, a child has a legal entitlement to attend a local public school unless there is a court order that deprives the child of that right or an IEP team has made it wrong. So many different, many different mentality today. It seems hard. It seems it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. 
And so, so, so I'm ready. For I'm ready challenge. for this challenge. And I was built, and I was for, built this. for this. I think that, I think we, that all have we all have a purpose in life. life. And mine's and is going to take on a task that, that most that most of back away from. Back away from. from. Impossible. That impossible. So people say it's impossible. I see possibilities. I don't see. I don't see anything as being impossible. Mentality, mentality, there are different, there are different mentalities, mentalities, but just like, just like there's different, different ways to teach people 